greater privileges. Good morning, everybody who's already here. As a reminder, we've started uh, switching the announcements uh, to the beginning of the session while we're waiting for everyone to join. So um, we'll be starting in about 10 minutes, and we'll have announcements showing on your screens until then. Can you hear me? Hey there. Um, I can. I, I need to have the slides queued up. Sorry, <laughs> don't know what to do. Can you? Can you all hear me? Yeah. What you need, Barbara? Yeah. I can't see the slides. All I can see is the multimedia window. Oh, you can um, make that smaller. Mm. OK, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> you can tell it's amateur hour here, folks. Um, Good morning. Uh, welcome to Plant Pests and Pathogens. Um, as you can tell, you don't have you're not in Lucy Bradley's hands this morning. I'm standing in for her while she's on sabbatical in Costa Rica. Um, so I'm Barbara Shu, Extension Specialist in Plant Pathology uh, and Director of the Plant Disease and Insight Clinic. Uh, as you've already heard, we get excellent ex excellent technical help from Lee J. Temple, our instructional technologist. Take it away, Lee J. Good morning, everyone. Just wanted to give those of you who are new to this interface a quick overview. Um, we're using Blackboard Collaborate. If you have a question that you want and you want to speak, you can click on the talk button. Um, we ask that you raise your hand to um, before you speak, and to do that is the next set of buttons um, over this second red arrow is. If you click on the raise hand, then that will let us know that you have a question. Beside that, there's a checkbox. And if you can see that, I want you to hover over it and click the Yes button. OK. And for those of you who might be having a hard time, I'm going to put the little sunburst right beside that checkbox. Now, those checks will turn to letters at some uh, point in time if someone has A, B, C, or D um, questions for you. And you can select those letters just like you selected the checkbox. Uh, another way you can ask questions is in the chat area. If you just type in your questions, um, either myself or Barbara um, or um, whoever's speaking at the time can answer your questions. What I'd like for you to do is uh, let us know where you're coming from. So if you click on the icon that looks like a starburst and then click on the map, we can see where everyone's coming from. Okay. 
All right, back to you, Barbara. Thanks, Lee J. So um, this morning's featured speaker is Chris Mormon. Uh, we've changed the title around just a little bit. You, Chris felt he had too much to talk about just talking about birds, so he is going to cover attracting songbirds. Um, we're not, our showstopper plants are on a summer break at least until August, uh, so that's on the schedule, but we won't be hearing showstopper plants today. The butterflies have fluttered down to Matt Bertone's time, so Matt's going to spend a little bit of time talking about attracting butterflies um, as advertised, uh, just different speaker, and then uh, cover the usual current issues with insects and followed up finally with current issues uh, with diseases um, from Mike Munster. All right, so that's the program. And without any further ado, we'll get going um, with um, Dr. Mormon's uh, presentation, Attracting Songbirds to Your Garden. I think he may have changed his title a little bit again. He's the coordinator. Uh, with uh, the wildlife biology program. Um, looks like he teaches some really cool and fun classes. Um, and we're really looking forward to this presentation. So Chris, you're on. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me, Lee? Yeah, you just need to speak up. OK, how about now? Is that good? Can you hear me fine? Yeah, you're a little low, but um. hmm. I'll speak really loud. Hopefully, that'll work. <laughs> okay. I didn't change anything. So I'm going to talk today about backyard management for the birds. As Barbara just mentioned, um, some of the stuff that I will cover today is relevant to butterflies, so it should tie in with Matt's presentation later. I'll begin by talking about um, this kind of big picture of primary principles, issues, and then I'll narrow down to some specific things you can do in your backyard. So we all, it's always important when we're talking about managing for wildlife to start with the basic habitat needs. These are things we learned in, in kindergarten, but it's important to remind everybody. For birds, foods can range from fruits to seeds to insects, and these foods actually change seasonally. So we need to understand the natural history of the birds we're targeting and the season of the year to, to know what we're trying to shoot for. So this is actually a picture of a blue grosbeak, beak. And you can see based on its bill, it's got a big, uh, large bill. And that indicates that it does eat seeds during certain times of the year, especially in the fall and the winter. And I'll talk more about foods in a bit. So in your backyard, you can actually provide water to birds via a bird bath, uh, maybe a, a, a pond that you may create for other wildlife. But generally, water is not a limiting factor for birds. We don't have to water, worry so much about water. Cover is typically a limiting factor, and it's often undervalued in relation to food. But one thing I'm going to challenge everybody today is to think about cover first when they're trying to attract birds or any other wildlife, and think about food second. Birds use cover year-round for a variety of reasons. They nest in it, obviously. They roost in it at night and during harsh weather. And they use it to escape from predators like Cooper's hawks. So uh, Lucy mentioned that there's already been an emphasis on native plants uh, during this uh, session, this year's session. But I just want to remind everybody it's important to avoid invasive plant species. Um, here, I actually had an action slide that didn't come out well. But this is just a list of some invasive plants that we know are kind of uh, nasty plants, although some of them may be attractive to birds because they produce fruits, that attractiveness is one of the very reasons these plants are able to spread and outcompete our native plants. So here's a picture of autumn olive. You can see there's Vinca, English ivy, Nandina, uh, Mahonia, which is not native to this part of the country. And in the background, I believe there's some Bradford pear. Um, you know, one thing I one thing I always stress is that we're tr when we're trying to attract native animals and here native birds, it's, it's common sense that we would use native plants to do so. If you're, if you're interested in a little bit more information about using native plants to attract native birds, you might see Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home. And I'll mention that a little bit later. And I'll provide some other resources later as well. 
So a couple of basic principles. Key principle number one when you're trying to attract birds or butterflies or any other wildlife is to promote plant diversity. We don't want a homogenous plant community with only one or few species. And butterflies are a great example of why we want to promote plant diversity because individual species of butterflies tend to be host plant species specific. And that means they lay their eggs, an individual species of butterfly lays its egg or eggs on only a single or few species of plants. So here is a picture of butterfly milkweed, and many of you know that it's the host plant or one of the host plants for the monarch butterfly. The plants in the genus Asclepius, the milkweeds, are the host plant for monarchs. And you can see on the left is the life cycle of a monarch butterfly. The, butterfly actually, the butterflies in the picture are not actually monarchs. The black butterfly is a spice bush swallowtail, and its host plant, no surprise, is spice bush and also sassafras. So if we want monarchs, spice bush swallowtails, zebra swallowtails, tiger swallowtails, hair streaks, we need a variety of host plants in our garden. And it, when we're talking about birds, this is important because birds actually eat the caterpillars, the larval stages of, of butterflies and moths. So it's important to attract butterflies to provide food for birds. Plant diversity also helps provide alternative foods within a season. And, you know, we're talking about birds. So these large nuts, acorns, and hickory nuts are not necessarily important for many birds. They are for some woodpeckers. But let's say you might be trying to attract gray squirrels. And you had red oaks in your yard. And red oak acorns are produced on the tree. Uh, it takes two years for them to mature. They're fairly consistent. And your, your gray squirrels may eat those red oak acorns. But let's say it's a bad production year for red oaks. But it happens to be a good production year for white oak acorns, which mature on the tree in one year. Then that, in this case, that white oak is an alternative food source for gray squirrels if red oaks aren't available. If no acorns are available, if it's a mass crop failure for all oak trees, or it's a poor acorn crop year, hickory nuts might be that buffer food or that alternative food source. We're not able to provide these alternative foods unless we have really diverse plant communities. So again, plant diversity is important. Uh, similarly, see, uh, fruits uh, are, can be important alternative foods. And we can actually think about fruits across the seasons, within season for sure, but also across the seasons. Different species of plants produce fruits at different times of the year. And here I actually have pictures of some early maybe a little bit later, and then really late fruit producers that are eaten by birds. So I have red mulberry, which is already past its prime, but it's a really important fruit, early season fruit source for, for birds like catbirds. And then there's a, a viburnum here. Um, there are other fruits that are available right now this time of the year. Um, blackberry is, is getting ripe, so that's a really important fruit, food source, along with the blueberries. Viburnum a little bit later, uh, then black gum dogwood. I'll talk about the, some, some of these other species in a bit. And as we move into the winter time, we have fruits that tend to persist on the trees. They're not the highest quality fruits, but the plant strategy is to have a fruit that persists until that's what's available and that's what birds will eat. So many of our hollies have fruits that persist and they're eating, they're eating later in the fall and the winter by birds. So again, important to have all these different species of plants to provide fruits year round. Same for nectar sources. If we're trying to attract butterflies or hummingbirds that may be attracted to nectar, different plant species bloom at different times of the year. So we can provide year-round or mostly year-round nectar resources by having high plant diversity. So in the spring, one of our early nectar sources for butterflies is redbud. And you can't really see, but there is actually a tiger swallowtail nectaring on this redbud. A summer nectar source may be passion flower. And then in the fall, we have uh, lots of asters. Here's a goldenrod that's in bloom that's pretty common in the fall. So principle number one is to promote plant diversity. Principle number two is to promote vertical structure. And vertical structure is just equivalent to the number of layers uh, of plant material in your garden, in your forest, in your habitat. So here on the right, you see a a graphical representation of a plant community with really high or complex structure. I have good structure. It actually has a ground layer of grasses and forbs. It has a shrub layer. It has a mid-story. 
as a canopy. On the left is a more simplified structure or poor structure. All we have there is canopy. The left is typical of suburban and urban uh, landscapes where we may have some canopy trees, but everything else is maintained or manicured or mowed. If you want birds, you need to think structure because birds can segregate themselves vertically. They're able to fly, and because they can fly, they actually can take advantage of all these layers. So if you're missing a layer, you're going to be missing the birds associated with that layer. Here I have pine warblers, which tend to be a canopy dwelling species. We have lots of canopy dwelling birds, but pine warblers is a good example. Wood thrush is a, a typical mid-story species. Our state bird, the northern cardinal, is, is a, a low mid-story species. And in the understory we have towhees, um, Carolina wrens, brown thrashers maybe, and other species that live in that layer. Miss any of these layers and you're going to be missing the bird species associated with that layer. This is critically important for attracting birds. Think about this all the time. Uh, similarly, I, I always recommend to avoid what I call specimen planting. This is a common uh, situation in urban and suburban landscapes where we have a, a very organized, synchronous plant community. Individual plant species are spaced out evenly. But because you have no continuity in the plant community, it can cause problems for birds and other wildlife. This can increase risk of predation. It can also decrease foraging efficiency as animals have to move from one plant to the other to access the resources that are available there. Here I'm showing a butterfly that may have to actually move among the plants here to access nectar resources so its, its energy intake is not as efficient as it could be otherwise. Uh, another problem with this kind of approach is we typically lack plant diversity. With these specimen plantings we often have single or few species of plants. Bradford pear, Bradford pear, red maple, red maple, boxwood, red maple, uh, Bradford pear. So we're, we're violating two of the, the two main principles, okay? So alternatively, we want to cluster or mass similar plantings to provide ideal habitat, to provide that plant continuity and continuity of food and cover resources. To me, this is also a more aesthetically a pleasing approach. It has a more natural feel that suits the eye, at least it suits my eye. Um, so here's an example um, of what not to do. So here I'm saying increase structural complexity, increase vertical structure, increase plant diversity. There is very limited food or cover resources for birds here. Plus it will take forever to mow this. Um, my parents had a, two, a, a large two or three acre grass lot when I was a kid and I learned not to like to mow. So I, I avoid these kinds of situations if possible. A turf grass is just not ideal for birds because in its very nature it lacks structure and plant diversity. There are a few species that will use turf grass like robins, but generally it's not ideal for birds. Uh, this is a tough one. So when I recommend a managed for wildlife, I encourage people to be messy, to think messy. And this goes against the typical model of the European garden where everything's clean and neat or the neat and green mentality. Again, much less time mowing. Um, I understand that there's a gradient here of tolerance, um, how, how much people are willing to tolerate. On the, you know, this is just to make some points. On the left, this, is, this plant, many of you may recognize it, is poison ivy. It's a highly attractive fruit producer for birds, hence it gets spread around the landscape as birds poop out the seeds. Um, understandably, it's not an ideal plant for the suburban backyard. I actually remove it from my backyard. Uh, pokeweed in the middle is a real, you know, a messy plant because when birds eat it and they poop it out, it poops purple stuff on your neighbor's car. I do have lots of pokeweed in my backyard. I can tolerate it. You know, some, and again, some of these plants are actually poisonous too, so consider that. And then on the right is blackberry, probably the best all-around wildlife plant in the southeastern United States because it has multiple, multiple values and all the different species that actually eat it or use it for cover. So if you can tolerate blackberry, I recommend you do so. So that, those are just some points that help guide, your, help guide the big picture approach to managing your backyard for birds. Now I'm going to get a little more specific and give you some background on birds and their general natural history that I think will help you understand what you can expect in your backyard during different seasons of the year. So I'm going to start with what's a group of birds called neotropical migrants. These are birds that spend about two-thirds to three-quarters of the year in the tropics down there with Lucy Bradley in Costa Rica. 
And then they come up to North Carolina and other parts of the United States during the summer months to take advantage of the resources that are here then. Uh, these are primarily insect eaters while they're here, and they're well known to be closely linked to native vegetation. And this is probably because their food sources, notably uh, butterfly and moth caterpillars, Lepidoptera larvae, are closely linked to native vegetation. So it's important to have native vegetation to attract their foods. They're also well known to be closely linked to large tracts of contiguous undeveloped forests or undeveloped vegetation communities. So when we have really fragmented areas from suburban or urban development, we tend to lose out on these species. Here's an Acadian flycatcher for an example. It actually flies out. It's called sallies. It sallies out and eats flying insects like mosquitoes. But it's generally found only along uh, streams and rivers with, with wide swaths of forest. So when we, when we clear these areas for development, we tend to lose the species. So this is one that will be hard to get. A uh, wood thrush is, uh, again, a neotropical migrant. It's a bird that uses similar types of habitat to the Acadian flycatcher, but it's a bit more adaptable to suburban development. And I do see them, for example, that occur in some natural areas around Raleigh in the metropolitan area. You may be able to get this bird, however, in your backyard during migration, especially fall migration when it's going to seek out fruits. Um, and I'll talk about some good fruiting plants that you might target to attract birds like wood thrush in a bit. Summer tanager is another example of a neotropical migrant. This bird tends to breed in the overstory or the midstory of mature pine hardwoods. So if you have a mix of pine hardwoods, um, you might have this species. Uh, again, though, it's not going to be very common in suburban areas. Uh, as we move west from Raleigh, we get the scarlet tanager, which is an even more striking bird. And again, it's not going to be common in suburban areas. But you may see these birds come through during migration. Uh, for example, this year we had five male scarlet tanagers in a single oak tree on campus at NC State, um, just above our wildlife office here. So it's pretty neat when you see them during migration. This is an orchard oriole. Uh, it's a bird that's fairly uh, common down the coast. It breeds on the coast. And it, it seems to be attracted to uh, front yard areas, maybe in more rural environments especially where you have an orchard-like setting, maybe pecan orchards or other places where there are large trees spaced out. And I see this bird really commonly nesting in these front yards. So it's something to look out for. And then lastly, the indigo bunting. Many of you may be familiar with indigo bunting. It's, uh, you see that bill. It does eat seeds during the fall and winter and even during the spring. So you can attract it to your garden or your yard uh, to a bird feeder during migration. It breeds in, in dense uh, low growth along cropland or agricultural field margins and in recent uh, timber harvest areas. But there are lots of indigo buntings around. So keep an eye out for them during migration. They may actually come through and stop off at your bird feeder, especially if you have certain kinds of bird feeders or if you're close to the places they breed. So I've talked about neotropical migrants. The next group of birds are what I call winter residents. These are birds that actually have a, they, they shift north and south like neotropical migrants, but they shift further north. So during the breeding season or this time of year, they're going to be breeding to our north, but they actually spend their winters here. And this includes a lot of species of sparrows, our dark-eyed junco, ruby crown kinglet, and golden crown kinglet, uh, yellow rumped warblers that are attracted to wax myrtle. And then our waterfowl, our swans, and many of our duck species, of course, we have resident Canada geese and mallards stay here year-round. But many of our waterfowl species are winter residents only. Uh, the songbirds that are at the top can be attracted to a backyard with dense vegetation that provides cover, especially evergreen vegetation, and obviously bird feeders. So we, we would target uh, these species in the wintertime using bird feeders in dense thickets of vegetation. The third group of birds are our year-round residents. They spend the entire year in North Carolina, or at least some individuals of the species spend the entire year in North Carolina. They're omnivorous. They eat all kinds of different kinds of foods. They're very adaptable, and they're quite common in suburban areas. Um, here's an example of a blue jay and a Carolina chickadee. These are both, both birds that may nest or come to bird feeders in your backyard. Pretty easy to attract. Um, here's a Carolina wren. Carolina wrens are cavity nesters. They do come to feeders. Um, 
I have a brush pile, which I'll talk about in a bit, and they are attracted to my brush pile, um, and they will eat suet and a variety of different kinds of seeds. And obviously, they will nest almost anywhere in a hanging basket. I have one that nests in my upside down canoe every season, and sometimes they try to get in my garage when I leave the door open too long. This is our state bird, the northern cardinal. It's a shrub nester or a low mid story nester. So if you have those layers available in your backyard, you should have cardinals present. They're very adaptable and they readily come to feeders. You see that seed eating bill and they, they love black old sunflower seed. Here's a brown thrasher, which is the state bird of Georgia where I grew up. Um, brown thrashers love dense shrub areas. They feed on the ground. Um, in my backyard, they do come and feed on seed and, and um, insects in the leaf litter beneath my feeders. Again, this is a species attracted to my brush pile or a pile of sticks and, and uh, limbs that I'll talk about in just a bit. So a brush pile, a feeder. Uh, for brown thrashers, they, I think they really do favor leaf litter. So if you maintain some areas of natural leaf litter instead of turf grass, this will be a species that will benefit. And I have a lot of natural leaf litter areas in my yard. And one of everybody's favorite is the eastern bluebird. Um, this is a species of more open uh, environments, uh, maybe something that a species that would do kind of well in a turf grass environment pretty well, as long as there's uh, nest sites. Um, they're a cavity nester, so as we all know, they are attracted to our nest boxes that we put up in place of natural cavities. I'll talk about that in a bit as well. Uh, this is a red-headed woodpecker, which is kind of the um, I don't know, the coup de gras if you're trying to get a resident species in your backyard. The key thing for these species, they prefer open uh, forest environments and they're going to nest in large diameter, big standing dead trees or snags. So you've got to have these large standing dead trees to have uh, red-headed woodpeckers. They will come to suet feeders in the winter if you have those up. I've already mentioned the pine warbler. This is a male pine warbler. Uh, pine warblers use the overstory of pine forest, hence their name, all across the state, no matter where you are in the state. So if you've got pine trees, you've probably got pine warblers. This is an easy one to get. You know, mid-story to overstory pine trees are, are important here. And I do have them come to my suet feeder sometimes in the winter or even other food sources when it's really cold. They'll come down out of the canopy to come to the bird feeders. So now I'm going to actually shift gears a little bit and I'm going to go through some of my favorite plants to attract birds, and I'm going to do this in, a, in the same kind of structural way that I, I mentioned before. So I'm going to talk about shrubs, um, vines, short trees, tall trees. Th these are just a few examples of plants that you might have in your garden. Some of this is repetitive. So here on the left, this is spice bush, Lindera, and um, research shows there are actually three species of fruit producing plants that birds seek out most in the fall. So there are three species, and this is one of them, spice bush, flowering dogwood, which is a common plant, and black gum, and this is sylvatica. So those are three species you might shoot for to attract fall migrating songbirds, spice bush, black gum, and dogwood. Black gum is obviously a mature tree, so this is a long-term investment. On the right is blackberry. I already mentioned that. It's a great wildlife plant. So for some shrubs, uh, there are a variety of different shrubs. Wax myrtle is a great shrub for the coast. It's an evergreen species that does attract the yellow rump warbler, especially in the wintertime. Here on the right, I have beautyberry, which is an aesthetically pleasing plant that does provide structure and um, birds will nest in it. Uh, birds will also eat these fruits, uh, especially later in the fall as other fruits disappear. Uh, I'm going to again encourage you to go with the American beautyberry and not the Chinese beautyberry. Uh, to me, I, it's always makes sense to shoot native, to go, go with native plants. Um, same for the viburnum. This is a viburnum species on the left. You can find non-native viburnum pretty readily in the nursery tray. There are native ones. You may have to look a bit harder, but I would encourage you to, sh to uh, try to uh, plant some native. There's a variety of viburnum species. Try to find some native viburnums to plant in your garden. They have beautiful flowers that will attract pollinating insects, and they also produce these fruits that are eaten by birds. Um, I've already made my point about poison ivy on the left, so I'm not going to say that anymore, but on the right is Virginia creeper. It's another plant that most people would remove. Um, 
maybe it looks a bit like poison ivy, it's just kind of weedy looking, but it does produce really highly preferred fruits for birds in the fall. It has beautiful fall color. It's only going to produce fruits when it climbs. Same for poison ivy, so you're going to have to allow it to climb on some structure to produce the fruits that are going to be attractive to birds. So moving up in structural layers, short trees, I've already talked about flowering dogwood. Flowering dogwood is a fabulous wildlife plant. Um, dozens and dozens of species eat the fruits when they're available, so I would encourage you to include some dogwood in your, in your garden if possible. Uh, service berry is the flower on the top right. Service berry or June berry in the genus Amelanchier provides fruits early in the season, so it's a spring, a late spring fruit producer. So again, you can address that seasonality by adding service berry to the garden. And then the bottom right is actually another viburnum species that's a bit larger, and this just shows you that different viburnums are going to show up in different layers of your plant community. So some viburnums get quite tall. I think this is a uh, refrigerant, refrig maybe. Not exactly sure what species it is. So here. Um, are some canopy species that you might shoot for. I've already mentioned black gum here. This is Nissa sylvatica black gum in the bottom left. These are the fruits um, that are highly attractive to birds. I've never seen a black gum tree with fruits that didn't just have swarms of birds on it. Robins, uh, maybe waxwings, lots of different thrushes like robins, bluebirds, and even some of our migrant thrushes like wood thrush. Yellow poplar is a real common tree that grows in our canopy. Uh, I, I like it as a canopy tree if you have it. It's a pretty fast-growing fast tree as well. It seems to harbor some caterpillars. It also produces flowers that are eaten uh, by some species like cedar waxwings, and then it has seeds that persist on the tree that may be eaten by finches in the winter. And then on the bottom right are oak trees. We often think of oak trees because of the acorns they produce, but I'm going to encourage you to think about oak trees for birds because oak trees probably harbor more different species of caterpillars than any other plants. In, in our region. Um, Doug Talamy in his book suggests that oaks harbor over 500 different species of moth and butterfly caterpillars. So not only are you managing the host plants for butterflies, but you're also managing foods for birds. And we have very large oak trees here at the Turner House Garden on campus at NC State University. And because of that, we get incredible diversity of birds migrating through in the spring that are eating the caterpillars here even though we live in a very urban environment. So oak trees in the overstory can really draw in birds, especially during spring migration. So now I'm going to even get maybe what I would call even smaller scale to talk about individual um, habitat components that you might manage in your backyard. So a bird bath can be an important addition to a backyard, although as I mentioned before, water tends not to be a limiting factor. Um, if you look at the literature, uh, there's some key points to consider when you're putting a bird bath in your yard. Uh, most folks suggest that dripping or moving water is going to be more attractive to birds than standing water. That said, I've always had a standing uh, water bird bath in my yard. Uh, it's best to have a bird bath maybe that's on the ground within view of a window so you can see it. Um, you may have one on the ground or one above the ground on a pedestal to try to mix it up. A lot of times I get people tell me their bird baths don't get used very often. If that's the case, I would move the bird bath around and try to experiment. Uh, it may be that birds are trying to find the right place where they feel safe, maybe further away from a cover or maybe closer to cover. Um, I think a lot of birds shoot for bird baths are more in the open, so when they're vulnerable and they're taking a bath, they're not so vulnerable to cats. Two to three feet in diameter, two to three inches deep with a rough and, sur rough and surface so birds don't slip. Make sure you clean your bird bath monthly. Um, you can clean it with warm with soap and water. Uh, just make sure you rinse it out. Uh, garbage can lids, rocks, hollowed out rocks, hollow stumps, any of these things can provide water sources for birds if you're looking for a more natural feel. I'm not going to talk a lot about bird feeders. I will li list some resources at the end that you can look up more information about bird feeders. Uh, I think the key thing is it's important to set up feeder stations or feeders very close to escape cover. They may be provided by vegetation in your yard or may, maybe by brush piles. I, I encourage people when they're setting up bird feeders to think durable feeders with a large seat capacity. Think practical, not decorative. Um, top, you know, ideal seed sources are black oil sunflower. I'd go for the high quality seed instead of the, the seed with the white stripes, which is cheaper seed. I like to use white millet. Um, sometimes I incorporate suet and thistle 
Um, in some areas, oranges are attractive to Orioles. I haven't had much success with oranges. And then mealworms can be attractive, uh, especially the bluebirds and other insect eaters. Uh, what I do is instead of when I can, I try to buy, not buy mixed of seed, I try to buy pure black old sunflower, or pure white millet. You get higher quality seed, maybe for a better price. And then you can apply this in the appropriate manner. Um, so what I mean by that is here is what I call a platform feeder. It's got mostly white millet in it and maybe some sunflower seed. But this is going to be attractive to birds like indigo bunting, uh, morning doves, a chipping sparrow here on the left. These are species that may typically feed on the ground, so they're going to like this more open environment. Instead of having a platform feeder, you can see this wooden one here. It really is kind of nasty. It's got lots of mold on it. You may just spread the seed on the ground. These same bird species will be attracted to that. Attracted to that. Here's what I call a tube feeder that you may be filled with thistle or millet. This is going to be attractive to species like this American goldfinch or pine siskins or even house finches. Um, I get morning doves that actually use my tube feeder because I usually fill it with white millet instead of thistle. So uh, most of us don't think about dead wood when we're trying to manage a garden for wildlife. Uh, I do actually have some large down trees in my front yard, which is a little different than the norm. But these dead trees can attract certain species like pileated woodpeckers or other species that feed on the insects that come to the decaying wood. On the right is a picture of a snag. And I'll just say that a standing dead tree is a snag. These standing dead trees are incredibly important microhabitats for wildlife. There are over 40 species of birds in, in North Carolina that use these standing dead trees, either for nesting cavities, for roost, for perches, or to feed on the insects. I uh, understand there are safety risks, so if you do have a safety concern, definitely snags are not something you want to have. But if you have a larger property where you can have snags in and, and safer areas, I would strongly encourage them. If not, take the snag down, but leave it on the ground so then it can be a down log and provide uh, food and cover for a variety of birds and other wildlife. Another approach to managing dead wood is to create brush piles. And this is actually a picture of a brush pile in my backyard. I live within the belt line of Raleigh, so I live essentially in a very suburban, urban environment. And I have this brush pile in my backyard. This is an especially important uh, habitat component in the winter when other cover is lost. I get lots of uh, white-throated sparrows, juncos, um, some other species of sparrows. Uh, I've already mentioned Carolina wrens and brown thrashers and eastern toadies that use this brush pile, and what I do is I actually spread white millet around the brush pile to provide kind of a home base for, for these bird species. I will warn you to check with your neighborhood ordinances or covenants to make sure it's okay to have a brush pile. Uh, interestingly, I did just receive a code violation in Raleigh for having a brush pile. It's in my backyard. I don't know how it was seen, but the uh, enforcer, the auditor came out and we talked about it and I explained the value of the brush pile. It actually prevents me from having to ship my uh, material off to the dump, so I think it's a win-win, but there are folks that don't recognize why you might leave big branches and stuff in your backyard, maybe unkempt. Um, this time of year, my brush pile kind of disappears in the vegetation, but in the winter, maybe it's a little more obvious, so definitely consider that. Uh, nest boxes are actually, they're artificial surrogates of those standing dead trees or snags that I mentioned earlier. So. Historically, birds like bluebirds would have nested in cavities in the standing dead trees. But now, because we don't have so many snags, especially in more urban environments, we can provide nest boxes as a replacement. So when we put up nest boxes, a couple of things to think about. Um, if, you're, if you've got a nest box that's targeting the same species, say an eastern bluebird, you want to make sure you space individual boxes out so they may get used by more than one uh, pair of birds. If they're very close, very close together, maybe less than 200 feet apart, you're going to be within the same territory, so you're only going to get one, one pair of birds using any of the boxes at one time, but maybe the same pair will actually use the second box as an alternative or for re-nesting, so that's okay. Uh, never use any perches. Perches just attract starlings and house fares, which are non-native bird species. In general, I just say avoid decorative boxes or decorative bird feeders. If you really want to attract birds on the wildlife, purchase or build practical practical nest boxes that are actually designed specifically for birds. Sometimes decorative boxes can have uh, design 
components that aren't, aren't ideal for species. Maybe they get, maybe if they're made out of metal, they get too hot. Uh, maybe they do attract non-native species like starlings. So use practical boxes or practical bird feeders. Use recommended dimensions. It's especially important to have the right entrance hole because the entrance hole determines the kinds of species that will use your nest box. So in my front yard, I have a one and a half inch uh, diameter nest uh, entrance hole, which is for bluebirds, and I have a smaller diameter nest hole, which is for chickadees and brown-headed nuthatches. Um, you can actually include an entrance guard to keep woodpeckers or squirrels from enlarging that entrance hole. It's just a metal plate. You can also use predator guards. I always encourage folks to mount their nest boxes on a post rather than a tree because black rat snakes are very adept at climbing trees and they were more likely, more prone to actually get into your nest box. Um, so you can actually put your nest box on a post and then actually put a predator guard below that nest box to protect it from predators. Any good nest box should have ventilation and drainage. I typically clean my nest box after I know uh, a nesting attempt has is, is come to an end, so I'm just able to monitor the nest and know that it's over. There's really no need to clean out your nest box except maybe in uh, January or February of every year. Pull out old wasp nest or any other kind of mess that's gotten in there. Sometimes flying squirrels will get in nest boxes as well. So a little bit about ruby-throated hummingbirds. This is our only species of breeding hummingbird in North Carolina. This is the female. Um, we can attract ruby-throated hummingbirds to our backyards by providing bright tubular flowers, and I'll give some examples of these in a second. Uh, many of these tubular flowers actually grow on native vines. We can add a feeder as a complement to native vegetation or native foods. If you use a feeder, you want to have four parts water, one part sugar. You don't want to go with more sugar because that's not good for the hummingbirds. Um, no food coloring. Uh, typically, the feeders are red, so there's absolutely no reason for food coloring. There's some, some concern that uh, food coloring can be carcinogenic if used, if eaten over and over for long times by hummingbirds. And then no honey is needed as well. The sugar is plenty sweet for the hummingbirds. Uh, our ruby-throated hummingbirds will leave in the wintertime. They're neotropical migrants. Uh, some individuals may stay around, and there also may be some winter rarities that show up if you're able to keep your feeder up. Sugar water freezes below 32 degrees, but it will eventually freeze once we get down to the mid-20s. So if it gets really cold, you're going to have to keep, find some strategy to keep the feeder from freezing. But if, it does, you know, if it's cold enough but not freezing, we could get winter rarities like rufous hummingbirds that show up here in North Carolina during the wintertime. Uh, just as another note, this time of year, ruby-throated hummingbirds are nesting, and they're eating a lot of insects. So again, insects are an important part of, the, of a bird habitat. Um, hummingbirds and all our other birds feed insects to their young because those insects are high in protein, which is important for bone and muscle growth. So with some examples of some species, plant species that may produce flowers that are attractive to hummingbirds. This is columbine, which is a really early nectar producer along with red buckeye. I don't have a picture of that here, but these are two early season nectar producers that start to flower right when hummingbirds arrive. This is coral honeysuckle, which is a little bit later. This is a fabulous native honeysuckle species, which is a nice alternative to the non-native Japanese honeysuckle. And in the background, you actually see a, viber a native viburnum paired up with the uh, coral honeysuckle. This is Carolina jasmine, which will uh, be nectared by hummingbirds sometimes, less frequently. This is trumpet creeper. This is one that's in bloom now. This is a highly attractive species for our ruby-throated hummingbirds. This is cardinal flower, which will draw in hummingbirds. Um, this is a, a music or water garden plant. We actually have them in our water garden here on campus at NC State. And this is jewelweed. And I actually have gone through kind of a seasonal approach, so early season nectar. And then jewelweed is a fall nectar producer that's really highly attractive to hummingbirds. You can actually see a female here flying around actually nectaring on these jewelweed plants, which typically occur along moist areas and stream margins, uh, especially along our greenways here in Wake County. OK, a reality check. Landscape matters. So for some of us, there are going to be constraints or limitations on what kinds of birds or how many birds we're going to be able to attract just because of where we reside. I reside about uh, one mile from NC State's campus in a fairly urban environment, so I recognize that some of the neotropical migrants I mentioned early on are not going to nest 
or breed in my backyard. Um, however, I do, I am able to see those birds come through during migration. So I get some benefit. And the, the reason we see those birds during migration is because we have, at least in my part of the neighborhood, there's a lot of canopy retention. A lot of native canopy of oaks and poplars and maples that were retained. So species tend to fall out and use those areas during migration. But I, I do recognize that I'm not going to have Acadian flycatchers and summer tanagers. I do have some neotropical migrants that seem to breed in my neighborhood, like red-eyed vireo and great crested flycatcher. So that can happen. But landscape matters. So where you are matters. If you're in a more rural environment, um, if you've got more canopy retention, even if you're in a more suburban environment, or if you're very close to a natural area, you can have more opportunities to attract a wider array of bird species. Um, just some other housekeeping things. It's important to keep records and learn what works and what doesn't work. I tend to recommend people keep records for at least a year before they start making any changes to their backyard to attract wildlife. So keep records during all seasons. See what's working and you want to you do more of that or, or keep those areas the same. And then look what's not working and you can change those areas. Uh, keep records of the species you see, their arrival dates, when they're there, what they're doing, where they nest, if they nest, if they're successful. And then you can learn through observation. And actually, it also it connects you to your backyard environment. I think it's a more uh, fulfilling endeavor in that case. Um, it's very important that we, we think about cats, domestic cats, when we're trying to manage for birds or any other native wildlife in the backyard. There's a recent study that was just published last year that suggests that cats, both outdoor house cats and free-ranging feral house cats, kill between one in four billion birds, that's B, that's billion with a B, one in four billion birds in the United States each year. And they kill many, many, many more uh, mammals, lizards, snakes, uh, salamanders, frogs, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, this article suggested that cats are the biggest uh, mortality factor for, for birds in the United States. So keeping your cat indoors is a simple, simple thing to do. Uh, this this cat right here, this is my cat on the top left. Uh, I've always had cats. I love cats, but my cats stay indoors. They're healthier. They're, they're plenty happy. And the native wildlife outdoors do just fine. Um, lots of resources you might reference uh, if you want to go to the next level. We have a website here at NC State. Uh, here's the uh, URL address. Uh, you can type in going native or going native for wildlife. It'll come up on your Google search page pretty quickly. This website has native plants that you might use for your landscape. It actually lists deer resistant native plants. Some basic principles on how to attract backyard wildlife or design a landscape. Um, and then how to identify and manage invasive plants if you wish to do so. The website also has a video. It has links to publications that will um, help you with some of this stuff. I also invite you to come to the Turner House native plant landscape here on NC State's campus. It's only a 10th acre lot, but we have some examples of some native plants that you might use to attract wildlife. Uh, some other guides and resources that I really love is my favorite bird field guide is the Sibley Field Guide to Birds of Eastern North America. Uh, Paul Ehrlich produced a book called The Birders Handbook, which has incredible natural history information about all birds in the U.S. Uh, a really fabulous book. Uh, if you're more interested in, in native plants and their wildlife values, it's Forest Plants of the Southeast and Their Wildlife Uses by uh, James and Carl Miller. And then Sally Wasowski's book, Gardening with Native Plants of the South, is a resource that I've always used. And for those of you super, super plant enthusiasts, I recommend the Manual of the Vascular Flora of the Carolinas. And I don't have a picture of it, but Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, is a popularized version of the talk I've just given. And he has some great information, more detailed information about the, uh, about the insects, especially butterflies and caterpillars. And then lastly, down here in the bottom, is to get a nice pair of binoculars. Get a good pair of binoculars. Spend as much money as you can. I tend to like 7 by 35 or 8 by 42 binoculars. Uh, Nikon makes some great binoculars. And if you really want to go to the next level, there's lots of high-end binoculars by Zeiss or Leica. Um, so that's my presentation, and I don't know if there are any questions. Chris, we have time for a few questions. Okay. Questions for Chris? I have a question uh, for those of us who are on campus. Where is the Turner House? The 
The tur I, I see some people are having trouble hearing me. Hopefully you can hear me now. The Turner House is on Hillsborough Street next to the Credit Union. It's a yellow brick building, and it's right next to the Brooks Avenue parking lot. Thanks. I have a question, too. Um, oh, this is Matt Bertone. Um, I heard somebody, somebody once told me that uh, if uh, you put out bird feeders, but you don't keep it consistent, the birds become dependent on that. Is that true? There is, there's no scientific literature to suggest that's true. Uh, there, are, there, there are pros and cons to bird feeders. I, I'd say the real con is that we concentrate individuals and there's a higher risk for disease. So that's why it's important to keep your bird feeders clean. Uh, birds are smart. Uh, they don't become dependent on any food source. And I've actually seen one study that looked at uh, food habits of chickadees up north, black-capped chickadees. And they showed that even with substantial bird feed available, chickadees only supplemented their overall diet with the bird seed. That 75% of their diet was still natural, natural things. And of course, during this time of year, these birds have to eat insects and other arthropods to get protein. So the bird seed doesn't provide that. OK, great. A couple questions in the chat box there. Can you, one is about, do you recommend Indian, Indian hawthorn and Virginia fringe tree as food sources? That's the first one. Second is about whether it's OK to plant uh, paint nesting boxes. So any of the native hawthorns are, are going to be, they pr produce fruits that are eaten by birds, especially birds like mockingbirds. I see them eating a lot of hawthorn fruits. Uh, I love fringe tree. It's a great native plant. It's, it's got beautiful flowers. It does produce fruits that are eaten by birds. I would say it's fairly low on the use range. Um, it's just not a prolific fruit producer, but it, it, the birds will eat the fruits. Um, painting a nest box, I, I don't. I wouldn't paint a nest box. I would use the natural wood. Maybe you can. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't paint or stain or anything. There's some concern that the the uh, the smell, the, the fumes from from paint or stains can be a problem for birds. Uh, you know, darker colors are going to actually make the box heat up. So, you know, if you're worried about rotting, the wood rotting, maybe try to use some uh, less rot, some more rot resistant wood sources like cedar. Um, but those, those boxes are often sold as, a, as less um, rot prone boxes. But, you know, really, you can get credit union. Credit union boxes in North Carolina for ten dollars. It's a low cost investment. You can replace them every five years, so you're talking two dollars a year. Any more questions? All right. Looks like we're satisfied. Thanks very much for a really interesting presentation. Um, I know most gardeners love birds, so. Uh, I'm sure lots of us uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. OK. Uh, Thanks, Barbara. I'm available yep. for emails anytime if anybody has any emails. OK, great. Thank you. So uh, next up, it looks like we're going to do some Critter or Not with Matt Bertone and Mike Munster. Actually, uh, with Mike Munster and Matt Bertone, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure we do that slide. What yes. did I say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, it's all about it's all about who gets first billing. <laughs> the um, the critter or not this time we decided to do a light version. There are only going to be five questions that we'll pose to you, and I think we'll still try and use the method that we did last time, which sort of puts you on the spot as to having to come up with an answer. This is for those of you who are new or don't remember. It's been four months since we've done this. The way it works is that we post a picture <coughs> or two of some kind of a situation on a plant or in a landscape or in a home. And if you think what you're looking at is some kind of a critter, that is an insect or a mite, spider, or some other kind of arthropod, or even a mollusk or a vertebrate animal, then you click on the green checkbox, that same green check that you used to indicate that you could hear um, VJ at the beginning of the presentation. If you think that it's something else, either a disease or a fungus, an abiotic problem, a man-made man issue, whatever else that's not a critter, then you click on the red X. We tally up and see how many people voted yes, how many no, and we'll then give the answer. At the end, you score up your own 
tally up your own score and see how well you did. So if there are groups out there viewing this and listening together, then please designate a person who will take the group consensus answer and post it to the site. And if everybody's ready, I turn it over to Matt, who will present the first critter or not. Okay, <clears throat> we got this uh, apple sample in uh, from Caswell County. And uh, on the note, it said yellow eggs present. Um, this is uh, apparently a new orchard system that was planted. And um, so what do you think, critter or not? Remember, checks for critters, X's for not. How much time are we going to give people here, Matt? Um, maybe another 10 seconds or so. You're being awfully generous today. I know. We've got an even split, so we should give a little bit more time. but. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. All right, there's the there's the result. It was Ooh. eight voted critter, eight voted not, and fifteen abstentions. <laughs> split. Wow, evenly split. Okay. Turns out this is not a critter. The individual who sent it in may have thought so based on the note about the yellow eggs on the envelope, but it turned out that this is the pycneal or spermatial stage of one of our gymnosporangium rusts, so cedar apple rust in this case, which gets on leaves and fruits, particularly of apples. This particular stage is actually where the sexual reproduction of the fungus occurs, and then the fungus grows down through the leaf and produces the next spore stage on the underside. And it's typically noticed by the reddish, orangish, yellow spots on the apple leaves. And again, it can also occur on fruit. This next sample was mint that came in in May of this year from Polk County. And there was a note on this one, too. There was a note saying, Something about uh, stink bugs. What do you think? Critter or not? Yeah, quick, clear out the old results. All right, you can start pulling now. We had to, re we had to reset the uh, poll from last time. Sorry about that. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, um, so this one, let's see, got a lot for not. Uh, yes, so that's, uh, it is a critter. And this one actually took a pathologist, Mike Munster, from up north saying, hey, that looks like four-line plant bug damage. Now, typically, bugs don't produce a lot of damage. They don't produce um, many signs, maybe a little chlorosis on plants. And they've got sucking mouth parts, so they don't produce chewing damage, obviously. But apparently, and I wasn't aware of this, and actually Dave Steffen, who looked at it, wasn't aware of this, and a couple other people, not to call them out or anything. But apparently, this is more of a northern issue, and this was out in the western part of the state. These uh, bugs have a saliva that's particularly necrotic to plant tissues. So every time they pierce the plant, it creates this necrotic spot. Um, so we got, luckily, in the bag, there was one of these plant bugs, and it confirmed what Mike had said at uh, guests and thought it was. And also, in the bag, it was pretty humid, and it looked like this plant bug had been parasitized by a horsehair worm, uh, which came out of it, right, it's shown right there. This horsehair worm is, uh, is a group of worms that parasitize insects and other arthropods, crustaceans, spiders, things like that. 
Um, anyway, a very interesting sample. These are commonly found on mints and the mint family and also on uh, asters and a couple other groups of uh, plants. Uh, so if you see these black lesions, these spots, it could be a pathogen, but check out for four-line plant bugs as well. All right, so this is Mike again. What I remember seeing it as a kid was on Snapdragon up in Minnesota. I'm not sure I would have tuned into that if they hadn't put the question about stink bugs on it. Reset. And okay. So we got this uh, tomato sample in earlier this year, and uh, there were these this is orangish powder kind of on them, and uh, and the the client was actually asking if this is sort of rust. Um, but what do you think? What do you think it is, critter or not? I mentioned where this tomato came from. What kind of a setting? What a greenhouse? This is a green. I think this is a greenhouse. Okay, in five, four, three, two, one. All right. Everybody who answered answered that it is not a critter. Well, um, that's wrong, actually. Uh, this was a very interesting one. This was a huge density of thousands of tomato russet mites. So from afar, it looked like these individual little orange grains were were either a fungal spores or some kind of other spore or pollen or something like that. But under the microscope, you see these elongate ice cream cone shaped mites walking all around. Um, and uh, they were all over the plant. And in fact, um, there was also uh, some damage to the fruit. And you can see these these mites all over the fruit and showing these little stippling uh, effects. So basically, um, if you're not sure, you can't really see them moving from far away. Uh, so look very closely with a hand lens, look for movement, um, and just make sure that you're dealing with uh, a pathogen versus a, uh, an insect or something or some other arthropod. Um, Anyway, it was it was kind of it was really interesting because it was such a huge mass of these on this tomato that it looked like spores. Our last critter or not question for this session has to do with some Chinese lace bark elms here on campus. Oh, there's one more after this. Oh, that's right, we switched. Okay, sorry. The the penultimate. <laughs> Critter not question. Chinese lace bark elm on NC State's campus. And the question is, what's happening here on the bark? These small reddish pustules emerging through the bark. Quite consistently, I might say, from the on the trunks and the main and the uh, and the stems and branches. Critter or not? Right. Now, why don't you give them a count on that? You're good at that. <laughs> okay. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. So the majority say cr that it was <laughs> a critter. <laughs> <Interesting. laughs> yeah, that is interesting. They got now, burned too many times. They got burned too many times. Now, this one, I'll admit, this one fooled me too. I saw this and I thought, man, that sure looks like the stroma of the fungus. Endothia. But it turns out that this is just the normal lenticels of this species of elm. And I could tell practically as soon as I started scraping them off with my fingernail 
and there was nice green healthy tissue underneath that I was not dealing with a fungal infection of any kind, nor is it a scale insect or other type of critter. And our last, now it is our last, right? Yes, this, this is, is our the last one. Critter or not for yes. today. So this was brought in by Dave Steffen, and uh, this is a uh, trifolate orange. And um, so what do you think? Oh, hold on. Let's uh, clear that. Do your polls again. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. All right, a lot of checks for critter. Okay, and what is it? You're right, it is a critter. Uh, these are sharpshooter eggs. Um, and I'm actually uh, not going to show anything more about this because I'm going to discuss this a little bit more in my section on insects. Um, but just know that this kind of looks like uh, it could be some kind of disease or some kind of thing going on there, but uh, but I'll describe a little bit more about what the, what we're seeing there in, in a little bit. All right, I'm going to change the polling to an A through D. I'm sorry, A through E. Multiple choice. Now, if you would go to that same tool where you were using to re register your responses as critter or not. And let us know if you got 0 to 1 correct, 2 correct, 3, 4, or by the letter E, show us if you had a perfect 5. Mm. You know, we called it light, or I did anyway, put light on there, but it turns out that this is a little bit more of a... Uh, little tougher, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, I could tell they were breaking a sweat there, and like I said, there was one that even confused me, so let's see what we got here. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, good. Uh, keeping everybody on their toes, just to make sure you're not assuming that you've got a pathogen or not assuming you've got a critter. Um, it's really good to look closely, and of course, if you don't know, we're always here to help. Uh, hopefully, we know too, <laughs> but it, take, it may take a little time to figure that out. Okay, so um, I'm going to start out my session on uh, some insects and things uh, with uh, continuing. I'm only going to present a slide, but basically uh, continuing with the butterfly and bird encouragement uh, in the yard. Basically, uh, like birds, uh, variety is a key for encouraging butterflies. Lots of different flower types, uh, lots of different flower colors. Apparently, purple flowers and blue flowers are very attractive, but basically, uh, moths and butterflies are going to be going to many different types of flowers to feed. Um, now, of course, you're going to want um, host plants for the larvae. Uh, this is uh, what Chris described before. So, for instance, black swallowtails, of course, they're a pest, the larvae are pests on dill and parsley. If you can spare some, they're good to have to uh, develop the, the larvae of these, of these really pretty uh, butterflies. Of course, monarchs are on milkweeds. Uh, but many other larvae are going to be on other plants that you're just going to naturally have in your yard. Uh, they're going to be on cherries or oaks or maples, uh, things like that. Some are going to be even on pines and such. Uh, and some conifers, uh, but most of, mostly a lot of the plants that you already have in your yards, if you have a high diversity, are going to ho host certain caterpillars. Also, um, keeping wildflowers and weeds in part of a yard can encourage the native butterflies to feed on these more commonly than non-native ornamentals, as described by Chris as well. So uh, a lot of these um, butterflies have evolved to only feed on our native species, and so um, if you have a little bit of habitat that's natural, you're going to get more of the natural, um, the uh, the naturally occurring caterpillars and such. And to attract them specifically, you can sometimes put out, uh, get a little uh, dish of sand and uh, wet it 
uh, during the warmer parts of the year. You can even put a little bit of uh, salt on it. Uh, this gives them some uh, some minerals to suck up and some water to suck up, and you might get butterflies puddling there. Um, I've actually heard that urine works really well, but I don't know if you want to be doing that all over the place. But uh, it's got lots of minerals and things like that. I know that people, lepidopterists, sometimes will do that in certain areas so that they can attract butterflies, as funny as it sounds. Or sometimes open fruits or, or ripe, overripe fruits. You can put them out and the uh, butterflies will come and drink the, the uh, juices from the fruits uh, because they're loaded with sugar and such. And just shown here is a uh, lysinid, uh, a hair streak butterfly on a black-eyed Susan in uh, my old yard. So, um, okay. And also, um, just uh, just another ad addition for the bird baths is to change your water, uh, just so you don't build up mosquito populations. Um, I've also heard, I don't know, anecdotally or people have tested, but putting a couple pennies in there too. Um, the copper actually can kill the larvae of uh, of uh, mosquitoes. So you try it out, see if it works. Uh, it doesn't cost much, literally. Uh, and uh, so anyway, um, that's my little uh, thing on butterflies, encouraging butterflies. But basically, if you have a very diverse yard, you're going to tend to see a lot of diversity in your in your insects and butterflies included. Okay, so. Uh, one of the things I was getting calls about and pictures about, and one of the things I noticed in my yard a lot this year, were one of my favorite groups of flies, the snipe flies, and particularly golden snipe flies. Uh, you may have seen them out in your garden. You may have seen them flying around and had no idea what they are because sometimes, some years, you don't see a lot of them, and uh, they're only present in certain environments. But they're in the family Ragionidae, which are the snipe flies. And this specific species is Chrysopilus thoracicus. Um, now, they are related. They're in the same group as horseflies, but there's only one genus, which isn't very common around here, uh, that feeds on blood. And uh, these are going to be mostly pests out west um, in rangelands, things, places like that. We do have them here, but you're, I have never heard of anybody being bitten by one here uh, in North Carolina or, or personally. Uh, the larvae of these flies, most of the other ones, the, all the other ones do not bite though. So the larvae of these flies are predators in moist soil in wooded areas. So think of a nice dark area with uh, ferns, a lot of undergrowth vegetation near streams, uh, nice organic soil. You're going to have these larvae living in there. Um, now this year we all we saw them often mating, uh, so they'll be attached. The male is a little bit is smaller than the female. And um, they all, this, this species in particular has a golden patch. They have a, uh, um, they have a golden patch of CD on their thorax and these smoky wing veins, also silver patches on the abdomen. And uh, just like many other fly groups, I discussed mar March flies last time. And the same thing happens where males, um, will have uh, large contiguous eyes and females have smaller separate eyes. This is the same thing as in horse flies as well. The females are the only ones that feed. Same thing in these snipe flies, the ones that feed on blood, it's only the females. Um, so um, you see here that uh, right here is a female. She's got these smaller separate eyes and here's a male with these huge contiguous eyes. And of course you can see the male is a lot thinner uh, the females are nice and large to so help produce eggs and everything. Uh, now we do have a number of species of them around here. Um, and uh, these are both two species of Chrysopilus. So one's Chrysopilus basilaris and the other one's Chrysopilus fasciatus. It's got golden stripes on it as well as a golden thorax, but not the smoky wings. Um, Interestingly enough, some of them oftentimes they'll sit in this weird position where they're kind of got to put their abdomen in front of them. They kind of very strange, looks like they're lounging or sitting in a, in a kind of lazy boy or invisible lazy boy. Um, anyway, these range in size. The basilaris right here is fairly small, about the size of a house fly, to thoracicus, which is about um, half an inch to three quarters of an inch large. Um, now, can anybody venture a guess as to which one's a male and which one's a female here? You want to 
I don't know if you want to put a little mark over one of them and uh, let's see. Let's do a uh, sun on the male and a happy face on the female. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Are they both male? Are they both female? Uh. All right. Well, yes, this one is a male right here. It's got the uh, big eyes. Uh, this one is a female. It's got smaller eyes. You can see there's a gap between the eyes. Anyway, just a little uh, trivia on how to identify male and female flies. Often this is the case. Not always, but often. Um, okay, so that's it for snipe flies. If you're seeing them around, they're just kind of around because you've got a nice, rich organic matter, nice mud around, and nice breeding grounds for these flies. Okay. Um, so my next topic is going to be on some plant feeding scarabs and chafers. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about the scarab subfamily Rutilini. Um, now, there are several subfamilies of scarabs. There are the dung scarabs, which are in the strict scarabiini. Uh, and then there's some other ones, uh, the May beetles and June beetles are in one. You've got the flower chafers. Uh, this, this group is fairly easily recognized. Uh, because they have these kind of flat, these claws lying on top of each other that are unequal in size and both independently movable. And you can see one is usually the blade-like and usually one is very large and one is either slightly smaller or much smaller. Now sometimes they have a little cleft in them or a little tooth, but oftentimes, you know, when you see them this unequal claws and kind of flattened state, that's you're dealing with a root line scarab. Of course, scarabs also have other characters like the lamellate antennae that open up like fingers and some other things. Um, now, there are many famous species, but they're not extremely diverse in North Carolina. You can actually get pretty good at identifying the different types because there aren't that many. Um, they're often metallic or with markings, as you'll see. And the larvae are going to be typical scarab C-shaped grubs. Um, they're going to feed in the soil and decaying matter or plant roots. This can include pests. And the adults are sometimes conspicuous because they will feed on foliage. Uh, so first up, and the leg, the leg shown here is actually from a very familiar one to everybody. That's the Japanese beetle, uh, Papilia japonica. Uh, originally from Japan, they were first found in the United States in 1916 in New Jersey um, and have spread uh, throughout the east and are mainly found east of the Mississippi. Uh, there are a few records just crossing the Mississippi, but they don't have them out west. And actually, they're on pest lists out in California to look out for this kind of invasive thing. So it's one of those things you might think of that's everywhere now, but actually hasn't gotten very far west. Um, now, the adults will feed mainly on the upper surfaces and the skeletonized leaves from a variety of plants. I think there are over 270 types of plants that they'll feed on. Um, Often it's just aesthetic damage, but they can in large numbers start to congregate on the plants and cause significant damage. In this case, culture control is the best. You can either knock them off in the morning so you can reduce the congregating uh, individuals. You can also just, they have this uh, habit of dropping off the plants. So you can just hold a bucket of soapy water underneath them and just let them drop into there and you'll control, you'll basically get them out of the population. Traps are sold. Uh, but these traps do more uh, to attract the beetles than to actually control them. Uh, unless you have the entire neighborhood doing traps, you're really not going to trap out them. And if you put that near a plant, it's just going to attract them to the plant. So really traps are kind of a feel-good solution, but they don't really work that well. Um, and we'll see with the other ones, I, I don't mention this with the other ones, but the other beetles we'll be talking about, many of them will also be attracted to the, the, the Japanese beetle bag traps. Of course, larvae can be turf pests when they're found in high densities. Uh, they can destroy the roots of turf and uh, have it come up and start to brown. Um, so if you uh, dig under, the, under your grass, you're going to find lots of different scarabs that can do this, but Japanese beetles are one of the most, most famous groups. Okay, um, now I should mention the Japanese beetle is a very beautiful beetle, but there's actually another in the genus uh, in our collection that I, when I noticed it, I said that is an extremely beautiful beetle right there. Why couldn't we have that as a pest instead of the Japanese beetle? 
uh, at least it's very beautiful. This is Popilia mutans. Um, but anyway, that's another uh, Asian Japanese uh, beetle that is not here. But I just wanted to point out how some of these things can be very beautiful, uh, as many scarabs are. Okay, um, another one that's commonly seen, I've, uh, people have been questioning it on uh, vegetables in the gardens, and uh, people have been sending in pictures of it. This is the oriental beetle, uh, Exomala orientalis, uh, formerly Anomala orientalis. Anomala used to be a big catch-all group, but it has been revised recently and split up into a number of genera, um, at least for the time being. Of course, taxonomists make everything complicated, but uh, we'll see. So these are originally from Asia, as the name suggests, um, and they are spreading from the east. Uh, so they are present here in pretty good numbers. So you can find them pretty well. Um, and uh, and uh, this one was just out of Lake Johnson in Raleigh. And uh, they do eat a number of different uh, things as adults. The larvae can be root pests. And uh, they're similar to Japanese beetles. Um, but uh, they're going to be a brown bronze, and usually with these two dark spots on the pronotum. Um, however, they do vary uh, very much in color. Some of them can be almost all dark, and you've got to basically use a key to figure out exactly what you're dealing with. Um, but anyway, this is a typical form right here, this uh, brownish bronze splotched with black spots on the uh, pronotum. And they're about the size of a Japanese beetle as well. OK, um, now a much larger species is the grapevine beetle, Pelidnota punctata. Uh, these are native and native to eastern North America. There's one species in the east, one species in the west. So this is our, our eastern species. They are large, about a, an inch long. So they're, they're about twice as long or two and a half times as long as a Japanese beetle. And they're this uh, brownish color, a little bit of a shiny iridescence, and with these spots around the edge. Um, now, this is actually one from the north. This is a northern uh, type of them. They're the same species, but these have darker legs and more of a mask. Our southern ones are going to have lighter legs, about the color of the body, um, and less of a mask. Now, the larvae actually are not pests at all. They live only in dead hardwoods, so in stumps of hardwoods or just logs. And uh, these are going to be uh, maple, um, keltus, uh, walnut, um, all different, all different, basically all different hardwoods are attacked by the, uh, well, decaying hardwoods are attacked by the uh, larvae. However, the adults can sometimes be found feeding on the grape, on grape, on the leaves, and the fruits. However, they rarely ever do so much damage to be economically important. Just be aware that they can be out there feeding on your grapes, uh, both native and cultivated grapes. And here you can actually see, here's a great example of the two claws, uh, the, the asymmetrical claws with this very large one and the smaller one, and they lie kind of flat on uh, together. Very different from the other, uh, the cause of other uh, scarab beetles. Okay, then I got a picture in um, of these scarabs on corn. Uh, somebody who's growing corn out in the field, and the Dominic Reisig, our field crops specialist, sent these in and said they kind of look like Japanese beetles, but also don't really. Uh, and he was curious, as was the grower, to what they are. And these are actually another closely related species. Um, these are Strigoderma arbicola. Uh, they're called the sand chafer, the spring rose beetle, false Japanese beetle, and rose chafer. Um, but uh, basically, they are native species. The adults are polyphagous, just like a lot of these. They're going to feed on a lot of different types of plants. Um, the larvae can actually be pretty big pests of roots of peanut, uh, strawberry, sweet potato, and certain pasture grasses. Now, to tell them apart from Japanese beetles and some of these other ones, uh, it doesn't show up here, but actually in the previous slide, uh, you can see they're very furry, very hairy on their pronotum. Um, and you can see on the bottom of the body right here, they're also very hairy. Also, they're a little bit more bronze, but they, the main feature is going to be these long grooves in the elytra, very deep, very pronounced grooves. 
Um, now there are other species of Strigoderma. This is about the size of a Japanese beetle. There's one Pygmaea. It's got some color, some yellow spots on the elytra. It is about half the size of a, of a Japanese beetle and very distinct uh, compared to Arbicola. Um, but anyway, uh, that is uh, I think that's the end of the uh, talk on beetles on the on these uh, plant feeding root line uh, beetles. So um, the next subject I'd like to talk about is uh, what our our uh, clear or not had to do with. And these are going to be the large sharpshooters. Uh, they are in the subfamily Cicadellini. They are leaf hoppers in the family Cicadellini. Um, in the subfamily Cicadellini, which are all the sharpshooters, including the small uh, scarlet and green Graphocephala, uh, things like that. But they're in the tribe Proconiini, which include the very large, our largest leaf hoppers. They're around one centimeter long. That doesn't sound like very big, but compared to most leaf hoppers, that's gigantic. Uh, these feed on xylem, as do all Cicadellini, all the sharpshooters, uh, of many species of plants. Because they're feeding on the xylem, which is very high in water content, they produce honeydew as well. Um, now, one of the bad things about this group is that they can transmit bacterial scorch or Pierce's disease, uh, xylella fastidiosa. Um, and especially implicated in this is one of the species I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Uh, however, they're usually not predictable or commonly damaging to plants. They're not going to be uh, reducing the fitness other than occasionally transmitting this pathogen. Um, so their feeding, their presence of feeding is not going to be very, uh, is not going to be uh, detrimental to plants, but because they're often found on plants, people are a little worried about them. Uh, here is one of the smaller ones at about seven or eight millimeters long. This is Querna costalis. Uh, very pretty species. Most of these are very pretty. Um, now, one of the most common ones that you're going to see is the broad-headed sharpshooter, Oncomatopia orbona. Uh, these have a very nice, it doesn't, I didn't get the color right in this photo that well, but th th these have a very nice blue color with orange. Uh, there's a couple of species of Oncomatopia that look very similar, uh, but this is our most common one and it's fairly large. It's going to be a little bit over a centimeter. Uh, now, when you do approach them, they're going to wrap around the opposite side of the stem for protection. They're very quick and very active, very uh, aware of people. Uh, but you will see them hanging out on stems of plants and sucking juices from them. Now, probably the most infamous and most uh, famous of these large sharpshooters is the glassy winged sharpshooter, Homolodisca vitropenis. Uh, this is a nice, uh, large, mature female. I'll tell you how I know that in a second. But this species uh, generally has purplish wing veins, very clear wings otherwise, and its uh, head and pronotum have these speckles of yellow. Um, a lot of the tropical species, and even these species as well, also have kind of a flared front leg that looks almost leaf-like in some ways. Again, these are very large. Uh, these are uh, about the size or even a little bit bigger than the broad-headed sharpshooter at about a little over a centimeter. Uh, now, the way I know this is a mature female, is she's got these two white patches on her wings. Uh, and this is related to our critter or not. These are patches of brocosomes. Now, brocosomes are basically little wax particles, very uh, uh, predictable in structure between species, and they're produced in the Malpighian tubules, which are these little uh, kind of tubes in the digestive system of insects. Uh, this is where the spittle from spittle bugs comes from, but also in leaf hoppers, especially these, these types, uh, it produces a liquid that, draw, that the female or the, the leafhoppers will spread on them with their legs and it dries and it contains these small particles of wax. Um, now the immatures and the young ones will do this and the non-sexually uh, um, active uh, adults will use this to coat their body which is probably used as a water repellent and also to keep their uh, honeydew from sticking to them. So it's kind of a strategy for that. But the reproductive females and the, the, the younger ones produce these kind of round, amorphous 
uh, ones, the reproductive females produce these long, uh, very, very clearly structured brochosomes, which they then put on those patches like seen in the, the, the previous picture. Then when uh, they go to lay their eggs, what they do is they kick them onto the top of the eggs uh, using their legs. And this is thought to keep predators and parasites away from the eggs. It's thought to be a, a repellent for the, uh, the, uh, ed, the eggs. Um, and just a side note, another quick side note is that you can see the little red eyes of these uh, hopper nymphs. And when they come out, they're actually grayish blue with uh, red eyes. And this is probably an acomatopia, which are most commonly seen. OK, so that's it for leaf hoppers. Uh, or the sharpshooters at least. You're going to see them around. Again, they're very conspicuous compared to a lot of, a lot of other leaf hoppers. And, um, okay, very quickly, a lot of people have been calling me about these white wax on their stems of their plants. These are, I discussed flatted plant hoppers last year, but basically these nymphs sit in the wax um, area. And uh, when you touch them, they'll expose this hopper. A lot of people are fearing that their aphids are fungus, but really these uh, are just aesthetic. They're not doing damage to the plant. They can be wiped off uh, very, very easily, and rarely is uh, chemical control needed. And usually these plant hoppers, uh, not uh, kind of closely related, but not closely related to leaf hoppers, are going to turn into adults that you will notice as well, which are going to be either the citrus flatted, which was pictured, the nymph was pictured in the last picture, or the northern flatted, uh, one of these pale uh, uh, whitish green, um, basically uh, leaf looking uh, uh, plant hoppers. Okay, so, and just a couple things, just some be on the lookouts for July and August. Very hungry caterpillars. We're going to have uh, probably coming out some prominence, Daytona, uh, some Anisota uh, striped oak worms. You're going to have uh, Hyphantria, the fall webworms, even though they're called fall webworms, are going to start coming out in early August and creating webs on the edge, on the uh, the outsides of the branches, on the uh, tips of the branches, and also in your gardens and areas like that, you're going to see a lot of pyrad moth larvae uh, feeding on vegetables and new growth. This is the uh, European corn borer. Uh, this one was found in pepper, feeding on pepper uh, fruits. Also, we've been getting a lot of uh, oak samples this time of year with a very small leaf beetle, Demetina modesta. These are don't have a common name, but they're just a little oak leaf beetle. Uh, these are small brown with uh, very broad scale-like hairs on them and a serrated edge of the pronotum. Uh, now they do skeletize patches of the leaves, but are rarely detrimental to the entire tree, especially mature trees. Um, but they can be present in large numbers, and which may be worrying to some people. And lastly, um, the lace bugs are out uh, in full force right now. Um, these are some uh, Stephanitis tachyi uh, on my pieris in my front yard. They are um, closer related, related to some other uh, groups, uh, but look similar to Koithuka, the, uh, the um, azalea lace bugs, and some, some other relatives. Basically, different plants have different lace bugs. And uh, with that, I'll uh, answer any questions and then move it over to Mike. Questions for Matt? It's a quiet group today. Um, if there's no questions, I guess we will move on and uh, let Mike tell us about disease issues. All right, um, taking notes here, note number one from Matt's presentation, buy Japanese beetle traps for neighbors. <laughs> number two is never invite Lepidopterus over to the house. <laughs> Let's talk about diseases. I titled this Looking Back, Looking Ahead, because I want to talk about some things that are just going out of season now, and then look at a... Uh, a list of things to be on the lookout for in the next couple of months because we're getting into the really hot season now, literally and figuratively. First thing I want to mention is that even though we know there are certain diseases that are going to be present year to year, it's really hard to predict how much there's going to be. 
So take a look at these leaves from the very same tree, which I'm pretty sure it was the same tree I went back to in early June, mid-June of last year versus this year. Much less leaf spot this time around from the fungus Passolorus cercidicola. I'm guessing that it had to do with the timing of rains that meant that this did not get off to as good of a start. What the future will bring, who knows. On the other hand, even though there was less of this, we had a tremendous amount of quince rust on ornamental pear this year. And we had talked about this in plant specimen pathogens before, but as my teacher of ancient history said, that petitioes mater studiorum, so we're going to do a little bit of a review on this. Again, it's going out uh, now, probably getting fewer inquiries, but we had a call as recently as last week, which I'll mention again later. During the period May 30th to June 12th, we had six digital image submissions of this disease to the clinic database, not counting the emails that came in and the phone calls. Remember, this is one of the gymnosporangium rusts, so it alternates between a woody rosaceous host, in this case the ornamental pear, and junipers. We've got the pointer here. We've got the infections on both the fruits and in this case on the stems. Now Chuck Hodges and I were talking about this yesterday and we speculate that these infections on the stems are going to be possibly perennial. So if you don't trim them out, they may pop up again next year on the stems. They are known to be perennial on the juniper host. So let's see how many of you folks have seen it. I'm going to crowdsource this a little bit. Again, if you have your hover over the or click on the pointer tool on your toolbar and expand it, you'll get a list of different choices from the sunburst to the pointing fingers arrow, check, X, and smiley. And if you would use those on the next slide, not on this slide here, on the next slide when I put the map up, to tell us as a group whether you had quince rust on ornamental pear, and you use that by putting a check on the map, whether you had pear but no quince rust, and that'll be a smiley face, or in places where you do not have ornamental pears in the landscape, then just give us a red X. So again, check for quince rust, smiley for no quince rust, and X for no pears. And if you do that on this map, please. Oh, yeah, Matt, Matt's pointing out that we do need a check box here for for wake. I have them in my yard. So some of the extremes, they're not uh, reporting the use of watermelon pears. Not too surprising that they're on the other banks. This is very interesting. The problem seems to be concentrated, at least observations, in the kind of slightly east of center third of the state. Let's take this one step further here and do a flashback. <clears throat> we showed this slide, I think, this past spring in plant specimen pathogens, although the photograph was from March of 2013. This is what quince rust looks like on eastern red cedar. It doesn't cause the big gall, as you see on the cedar, cedar apple rust. And this goes to a point that the caller last week had, which was, is our tree the victim or the culprit? Apparently, there was some concern there that the neighbors would blame them if their other neighbors' trees started showing up with this disease. So remember that the tree, in this case the pear tree, is the victim, if you want to think of it that way, because the infection had to take place from a red cedar where the fungus was sporulating much earlier in the spring. And again, as far as control here, 
the only thing that we would recommend in the landscape would be pruning if you can do so safely. For those in the mountains, there's a similar sort of rust in terms of what it looks like, but this time what we call the e-seal stage is not on a rosaceous host, it's actually on the needles, and I believe it can also get on the um, stems and maybe even cones of hemlock. This particular picture came from Alexander Krings in the, in the plant biology department here, who photographed it in Ashe County on the Carolina hemlock. And this is, according to Chuck Hodges, probably the Copsera hydrangea, which is called the hemlock hydrangea rust because it alternates between hemlocks and hydrangea. There's another one very similar, have the, basically the same appearance. Under the microscope, you could distinguish it, but that one alternates between hemlock and plants, like ericaceous plants, so rhododendron and vaccinium. The other problem that we saw on the ornamental pears this year were several places that were reporting leaf browning and leaf drop. Now here it was uh, the leaf drop I picked up just looking at the bottom corner of this particular photograph, but you can see the browning. And the question I want to address here is why do I not think this is fire blight? Because fire blight will cause similar blackening of leaves and stems, but in this case, I don't think so. And one of the reasons is the leaf drop, because fire blight, you wouldn't see that. The other reason is with fire blight, you're not going to see the leaves blackening on one part of the stem, but then toward the tip, you have leaves that are not blighted. So something like this photograph here, where you've got green leaves out here, but a blighted stem, or at least leaves, on this portion here. Now, I can't guarantee this, but I'm suspecting this is some kind of an environmental issue that's causing this, and I'll speculate a little further in another moment. But the thing that I would want to see here would be what does it look like under the bark? Is that a green stem? Still, I suspect it is, because otherwise this would be dead also. It would have been girdled. Before we talk about what might have caused that, let's crowdsource this one. And now still give us a red X. Uh, Hate to have you repeat that to folks who don't have ornamental pears in your landscapes. But give us a red X if you don't have ornamental pears. A smiley face if the ornamental pears looked peachy. Not like peaches, but in the sense of very nice. And this time a sunburst if you saw pears with the leaf browning and leaf drop in your area. And here's the map. Good folks know what saying. Ah, interesting. Looks like the, the extremes again were looking better than in the middle. So the green check, I'm not sure how to interpret that one. It looks like we had sort of a concentration of areas that we were experiencing the leaf browning. All right. Now here's, here was the other clue. Now I'm going to give credit where credit's due here. It was Dr. Dave Ritchie in our department who first brought this problem to our attention, that there was a lot of it happening in Durham County, and I think it was a Durham County caller who said it looked like fall in the spring, the number of leaves that were dropping. Possibly this is what was going on, just speculation at this point. But if you'll notice on the underside of the leaf here, this is that same sample that was submitted as photographs I showed the leaf browning on. They submitted this as a quote unquote healthy leaf, but weren't really convinced of that. But you'll notice little raised blister like bumps there. And this could be something that we call edema, which occurs when you've got soils that are moist and roots are pumping up lots of water that the foliage cannot transpire. So one possibility here, one hypothesis, is that 
the tremendous rains we got in our particular area, the big one was on May 15th, saturated the soils just long enough to cause stress on these plants. And then in a short period of time, a lot of leaves browned on them and started dropping off. So the, the long-term prognosis, if that diagnosis is correct, is that these trees will recover. I don't know if they'll give another flush this year, but they should be all right next year, barring any kind of further environmental insults. It'll be interesting to keep an eye on this and stay tuned. Every plant specimen pathogens, we put up our list of be on the lookout, but I've elevated three of them from just be on the lookout status to all points bulletin status. And the number one on this list is going to be related to the fact that potato late blight was first confirmed this year in North Carolina on June 19th, so just a few days ago, five days ago. And it was in Carteret County. This is the photograph of the leaves that were sent into the clinic. I think many folks know what late blight is, but if you are seeing it, either in potatoes in the east or tomatoes in especially in the mountains a little bit later, please do send in a confirmatory sample to the clinic. Let us know so that it can be entered into the systems and the alert systems and so on. The other all points bulletin that I'm putting out is for cucurbit downy mildew. This was first confirmed in North Carolina on the 9th of June on a cucumber from Duplin County, North Carolina. Remember, this is a disease that cannot overwinter here in our state. It has to blow up, well, not blow up, but blow northward with the winds coming from overwintering areas such as Florida. It can also be brought in on infected transplants. Typical symptoms are yellow spots, especially angular leaf spots that turn eventually brown and dry up. And then the, if the weather is humid, the slightly bluish gray sporulation on the underside of the leaf. Blotches can be larger and less uh, angular on watermelon. So not only North Carolina has this situation going on now, but it's been reported in this month from Georgia and South Carolina, among other places, on a wide range of crops, cucumber, cantaloupe, squash, and watermelon. Usually it's the cucumbers, the melons, and the watermelon that are the most affected, where squash and pumpkin would tend to be less affected. For managing cucumber downy mildew in the home garden, there's not much we can do. There's some chemicals that are used depending on the proximity of the disease, whether it's expected to be moving into an area, weather conditions, and so forth. For commercial production, but when we're talking about the home garden, there's not much you can do. Trying to keep leaf wetness down by overhead, avoiding overhead and late day watering. Weekly fungicide applications can have limited effectiveness. Chlorophyllol is one that's recommended and probably even less effective would be copper, but it's about your only option if you are trying to produce under an organic system. Harvest your fruit early if you're getting heavy leaf loss to avoid sunburn. Next year, maybe plant a little bit earlier to try and get ahead of the epidemic. And there may be some future hope out there for some resistant varieties. As far as keeping track of these, both these diseases, the late blight and the cucurbit downy mildew, and just our changing disease situations in general as we move into the summer, I recommend keeping tabs on our plant pathology portal, which is at http slash slash plantpathology.ces.ncsu.edu. There will be links there to further information about both of these diseases, including the late blight tracking at usablight.org, which Dr. Barbara Shu has pointed out in the chat box, and also to the IPM Pipe Center for keeping up on the cucumber or cucurbit downy mildew situation. This particular all points bulletin is my own, not coming from our vegetable pathologist, but 
we got a sample from a nursery of Barbary, uh, which um, I think it was Berberus Simbergiana is, I believe, the species on that particular one. And it had a heavy case of powdery mildew. And I just would like, on all the powdery mildew that we'll be seeing this summer, if you do happen to see it on Barbary, I would like to be contacted about that and get a sample. So if you could kind of keep that on your list of things to, to watch for. Now, as last year in June, I'm going to do the BOLO list, the Be on the Lookout list for July and August in the form of a quiz. So take out a piece of paper and number it from 1 to 92. No, that was a song. Just from 1 to 6 should be sufficient. Most of these are not the same ones I used last year. Most of them. So this one will be for individual use. You don't need to come to consensus necessarily as a group. First case. We have plants that wilt and die rapidly in midsummer. Under humid conditions, we see the mycelium, the fuzzy growth of something occurring at the soil line on the ground. Eventually, there may be little white pills that mature into round balls about the size, shape, and color of radish seeds. Case number one, what do you think this is? Let's jot that down on your papers as number one. Case number two, turf grass, particularly well, on this uh, question, it's going to be tall fescue, so for places that have cool season grasses, tall fescue with dead patches, and on closer examination, there seem to be actual lesions on the leaf blades themselves. Case number two to be on the lookout for in July and August. I saw that, no copying. Case number three. The apple on the left, ignore the fly speck here. We're talking about this large area of decay. You can sort of see some fruiting bodies developing here in the center of it. And when it's cut in cross section, the decay forms a V-shape pointing toward the core of the apple. What would this disease be? Case number four, be on the lookout for. This is a watermelon leaf. This is not actually our photograph. It's off of Bugwood. So a watermelon leaf with this sort of dry necrosis between the veins. Case number five, going back to the flower garden. This is daylily. And we have dead areas that start at the tip and work their way down in a V pattern. I guess it's kind of the theme here is the, the V shape pointing down the midrib toward the base of the plant, leading area of yellow, or what we call chlorosis, around the, around the dead stripe as it moves toward the base of the plant. And number six, tomato plants with a grayish sort of grayish green blotches that progress to leaf death rapidly and also involve the fruits. What disease or disorder might this be?
So those are our six questions. Let's take a look. Number one is southern stem blight caused by the fungus Sclerotium rothsii. This is a soil-borne organism that attacks directly at the soil line. It can be a problem in the flower bed as well as in the vegetable garden, tomatoes for example. And it doesn't fortunately spread very easily. You want to avoid spreading it to new areas. Rotation is one strategy. Use of foil at the base of the plants where you know you have it. But it always seems to attack right at the soil line, very close to it. Number two, of course, was brown patch caused by the fungus Rhizoctonia solani. This is going to be active now that soil temperatures have warmed up. And there are actually pesticides that can be used if you're so inclined to try and keep this in check. More information on that, I would recommend going to the Turf Files site, www.turffiles.ntsu.edu slash diseases for more information about this and other turf diseases and their control. Number three is a disease called bitter rot caused by species of Calatotricum, another fungus. And that's very characteristic, the V-shaped decay moving in toward the core of the apple. So do, of course, keep up on your spray program. We have information on the uh, connected from the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic website for the spray program for home orchards. Number four turns out to be ozone injury. Watermelon is one of the things that it's probably most uh, seen and photographed on. It can also occur on potato, it can occur on tomato. So not necessarily uh, being seen at this time of year. I looked at the records in a couple of potato samples that we had with ozone injury actually a little earlier in the year. Why does this happen? Well, of course, the hot summer weather, stagnant air, sunlight reacting with pollutants in the air forms ozone, which we like to have up in the stratosphere where it protects us from UV radiation. But we don't like to have down at ground level where it damages plants and is hazardous for people's health and so on. If you remember from last week, there was actually an air quality alert for both the metropolitan areas around the Triangle and Charlotte. So we expect, of course, to have more of this kind of situation coming up soon. Don't, though, jump to conclusions that every kind of speckling on plants is caused by ozone. In this case here, we've got and azalea on campus, and looking at the underside of the leaf and these fecal pellets or flecks, you know immediately that you have lace bugs, which will lead me to go back to Carol's question in the chat box from earlier that I don't know if it came after I'd already taken the helm here, but Matt, the question was, what is the best way to control lace bugs? Hmm. Um, well, again, I'm not the best person to talk to. I would say uh, Jim Baker or Steve Frank would know more about that. But uh, apparently um, using approved uh, insecticides is making sure to spray the underside of the leaves. Obviously, that's where they congregate. Um, once they lay the eggs, uh, they're pretty well protected with uh, fecal matter and in the plant tissue. So you won't be able to kill next year's uh, um, uh, insects. But uh, treating early on when you've got the nymphs is probably better. So by this time of year, uh, you may not get what's going to be a good control for next year. Um, but again, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I deal with the identifications, and uh, so I'm not up to speed on all of the control measures. Um, but uh, contact uh, uh, Steve Frank uh, or uh, look in on online. NCSU has some uh, control recommendations for lace bugs. Um, we have some fact sheets on the several different types of lace bugs, too. And they're all basically treated probably the same way. Um, you also don't want to spray when the flower, when the, especially when the azaleas are about to flower, things like that, uh, because some of these uh, pesticides uh, can go into the flowers and affect pollinators. Um, and there was another question, I think, too, uh, above there. Uh, is there a reason for low amounts of butterflies? 
Um, I don't know what types you're talking about, and I'm not sure. You know, sometimes anecdotal or just seeing, uh, not seeing some some years and seeing more other years is very difficult to know. Uh, it could be weather or climate conditions. Uh, it could be um, almost anything, you know, outbreaks of parasites, uh, things like that. It would be very difficult to know whether one year is definitely be better or worse for butterflies than the other. But I'd have to know more about what specific butterflies uh, you're concerned with or uh, concerned about seeing. All right. Finishing up the quiz then. Number five was daily leaf streak caused by fungus Oryvacidium microstictum. This, uh, it's interesting, the susceptibility to this disease, is, disease varies according to cultivars and of course the uh, usual recommendations of trying to keep the leaf wetness down will apply here and probably removing the debris will give some advantage in keeping the population of the fungus down. Number six, remember I said that most of the questions were not repeated from last year. Number six was repeated. This is late flight or Phytophthora infestans on tomatoes. So be, of course, especially alert for this in the mountains. It's interesting, we were afraid a couple of years ago, we had an early start to it and afraid it was just going to take off and it didn't really seem to do that. Again, unpredictable. But if you do think you have it, this is when we want to see a sample for confirmation. Just to wrap up in the last few seconds here, more things that will be on the lookout for in July and August on fruits and nuts, peach scab and peach brown rot, mummy berry and blueberry, pecan scab will just be getting started before we uh, meet again in PPNP in August, and in uh, terms of fruits and nuts, World Cup fans such as, such as myself. Vegetable gardens, bacterial spot on tomato and pepper, southern bacterial wilt, which can sometimes look in the early stages like you've got the uh, southern stem blight and the fungus hasn't appeared yet but in southern bacterial wilt it won't ever appear. Victoria leaf spot on tomato and tomato spotted wilt virus which can look quite similar to each other. On ornamentals and trees, Phytophthora root rot, powdery mildews of course such as pictured here on the euonymus, dot hole on prunus species, cherry trees and cherry laurels, root knot nematodes, we're still seeing winter injury on warm season grasses that haven't recovered from it yet. Rose rosette virus, bacterial scorch on sycamores, on pin oaks, and uh, those would be the number one and number two hosts for that, although it gets on many other plants. And slime flux of hardwood trees in the heat of the summer, which we will also have to look for. So with that, we will see you next time in the steamy heat of late August and wish you a good couple of months between now and then.